thing about personal, about preconceived notions is that they are shaped by the beliefs and those things that we may have experienced in our life. Their experience, sometimes it's from things we've been told from our parents, from those people in our environments like our neighborhoods. So it's basically all those things that influence each and every one of us. But don't you know that sometimes we get influenced by things that are not true, things that are not actually factual even. Many of us know all the kind of crazy stuff that you can get online about what's true and what's not. Some of the stuff that I hear from my children according to what's online is true just blows my mind. One of the ones that I remember them talking about and it still sticks to me today is that water is not wet. <laughs> and the funny thing about it is they, they, this was their belief, they really believed that. And, and not only that, there was such debate as to whether water was actually wet or not. First of all, I'm trying to figure out, is it really worth that much of your time to be debating about whether water is wet or not? It's just absolutely amazing that to me some of the things that we would um, choose to spend our time worrying about. Another example that is in the current day that we all can, can, can attest to, and I don't want to get into the political debate, but... How many of you saw those commercials that say that anybody coming over the border is a criminal? I see these ads from all these politicians that say anybody that comes over the border is a criminal. Now, when you're talking from, strictly from the sense of the law that, okay, it's illegal to come over the wall, okay, yes. But then they stretch that and make it seem that everybody that comes over is a murderer or a convict or that they're coming to cause you harm and all these crazy things. And then what they do is they take the most dangerous and fearful looking people and put them in the commercial. All in an effort to sway your thoughts and your opinions. So once again, we see how it it's co goes to show us that sometimes the things that we see, sometimes the things that we hear, sometimes the things that we take into us are not necessarily the truth. So we have to be mindful that we don't just accept anything into our minds as fact. We need to try every word that we receive by the word of God so that we are not influenced and that we are not judging people based on those things. So once again, there are many things that influence us. And because of this, we have certain notions about things. Let me give you an example. Bishop Wu, can you come up for a second? Jordan, can you come up for a second? All right, I need you guys, this is interactive, so I need you guys to be with me, okay? All right. This is Bishop Ruth, my mom, and this is Jordan, my, my youngest daughter. Okay. Let me ask you guys a question by show of hands. If you needed advice for something, would you go to Pastor Ruth? Raise your hand if you would go to Pastor Ruth. <laughs> okay. Or would you go to Jordan for advice? So, so many people raised their hands that they would go to Pastor Bishop Ruth. But what if I told you the question was how to operate an iPhone? Oh, oh, oh now you have a difference of opinion. Wow, Pastor Ruth, you see how quickly they turned on you. Wow. And Bishop, Bishop Ruth said, they're right. <laughs> All right, you can be seated. You guys may go. But I just do this to let you know that our, our, our thoughts, our minds, our perspectives are changed based on the information that we receive. At first, it seemed very obvious that the answer and the solution to any of these questions was going to be Bishop Ruth, almost regardless of what the question was. But once I gave you the information to further clarify, all of a sudden, the answer was obvious and clear, sorry mom, that the person that was right for the job was Jordan. 
See, we are sometimes so quick to react based on things because of things that we hear and things that other people have said. And because of that, we make opinions. We form opinions. Okay, let me ask um, um, Brother Ivan, can you come up? Okay, Brother Ivan. All right, so my question to you is this. If you were starting a basketball team today, which one of us would you start with? Uh, Ivan? Raise your hand if you think you would be Ivan. Okay, raise your hands if you would choose me. Okay, so Ivan is pointing to me. And some people over here said, I would choose you because what? You know that I played basketball in college in all my life. And until my knees went bad about a month ago, I was still playing. <laughs> Ivan plays, but he didn't play to that level. But the information that she knew and some of you already knew led you to make a different opinion than what is obvious by the fact that I am not as tall as Brother Ivan is. I am not as wide as Brother Ivan is. I probably am not going to box out like Brother Ivan is. But I have played and developed skills throughout my entire life that made me perfect for this position. So once again, thank you, Brother Ivan. Once again, we have to gauge the information and the choices that we make. That's right. It's not always as obvious as it seems at first glance. It is not always that way. Brother, Brother Manny, come here for a second. <laughs> Brother Jaden, can you come down here for a second? This is Brother Manny. He is one of our security guard people. All right. And one of our ministers. He's a dual threat. Come this way a little bit, gentlemen. Okay. So my question to you is, if I was going to ask you if these two were to fight, how many of you would choose Brother Manny? Okay, how many of you would take Brother Jaden? <laughs> Minister Larry said, well, he can run faster. <laughs> okay, let me ask, let me throw this into the mix. What if I were to tell you that Jaden has been taking martial arts training since what, you were like four or five? Four. About four or five years old, he's been taking martial arts training and is an expert in martial arts. Now let me ask you the question, who is taking Jada now? So now, now we are now in a position where some people are starting to question their initial decision based on this new information, right? Before, nobody in their right mind was taking Jaden over Brother Manny. And I, will, I didn't even add to the fact that I, by profession, his side gig is that he's a bouncer. Right? So, but, but when I gave you this about Jaden, about him being a martial arts expert, it changed your opinion. Right? And some people chose him. Let me add this to the mix. What I told you about Jaden was an absolute unequivocal lie from the pit of hell. <laughs> This man has never done martial arts a day in his life. Forget breaking a board. He couldn't even hardly break wind. But let me show you something. You believed what I said and allowed what I said make you doubt what is clearly and obviously the truth. The point I'm trying to get us to see, you can go, is that we have to be mindful of the information that we allow into our minds and into our spirits. 
Because that information can alter our decisions. It can alter the way we view people. It can also alter the way that we even treat people. Our preconceived notions are powerful, powerful, powerful. Let me ask you one final question. Who is the GOAT of all times? LeBron James or Michael Jordan? Michael Jordan, raise your hand. LeBron James, raise your hand. Now, one thing you will notice is that LeBron James fans tend to be all of the younger generation. Why is that? Because they didn't grow up in the time of Michael Jordan's era. They didn't get to see, they didn't get to experience Michael Jordan playing in his prime and have the feeling of watching one of those Michael Jordan games with the Chicago Bulls in which he did things that nobody has ever seen before. And he changed the entire game. So because we grew up in that era, we are influenced by all of those things that we saw when we watched Michael Jordan play, and that is how we perceive greatness. But now this younger generation can make the same claim. They could say, man, I saw LeBron James when he was 18 years old come into the NBA in Ottawa, and he was already an all-star. They could talk about all the accolades, all the championships, all these things, and make a legitimate argument as to why LeBron James is the best player. But the point of the matter is, it's all about your perspective about what you were influenced by. What did you see with your own eyes? What were your emotions when you watched the game? And all this leads to shape our opinions because our preconceived notions are based on these things. So what I want us, I need us to understand is as criti- Christians, it's critical that we challenge our preconceived notions at all times. So that we don't find ourselves in the situation where our preconceived notions allow us to judge people unfairly and unjustly. So let us go back to the scripture. Um, When we looked at the scripture, there's three people that we want to talk about. The first part of it says that um, there were three, we, we have three main characters. One is the Pharisee, the next is the woman, and the third is Jesus. Do you guys know what a Pharisee is? Raise your hand if you know what a Pharisee is. Okay. So some of you already know, even before this scripture began, what a Pharisee is. Now, when we look at this Pharisee in the context of this scripture, can you guys give me some words to describe the Pharisee? Just shout out some words that you think of. as uh, Self-righteous. Hypocrisy. Judgmental. Educated, very, that's a very good one. Very educated in the word of God. They knew everything about the Bible. Prideful. But, okay. Okay. So we have all this information about what the Pharisee was based on our understanding of the word of God. And then it is further backed up by what the Pharisee says in this situation and what he does. Right, So we have our preconceived notions about this person. Now let me ask you about the woman in this scripture. What are some of the words that you might use to describe the woman? Uneducated. Loose. Sinner. She said a tart. She said like this. (laughs) Any other words to describe the, the, the woman? God-fearing, grateful. Now, one person said educated, uneducated. Receptive, okay. Where do we get this, this notion that she was uneducated? How do we get to that knowledge that she's uneducated? So his assertion was that the reason why we come to the conclusion that she was uneducated is because she walked in and she placed her hands on a holy man. Why does that seem strange? It's because that seems, according to the times, that it's not something that was socially acceptable. 
But when we consider the context of what is going on at this time, when we consider the fact that this woman was so desperate and so in need of deliverance from her sin that she began to believe that I don't care what the notions are of the time. I don't care whatever the people are going to think about me. I don't care what they're going to say about me after the fact. I don't care that people think I'm a sinner. All I know is that I need deliverance from the man of God. So when you think of it from that perspective, you no longer think that she's uneducated. In fact, it's the exact opposite. Because she weighed all the consequences of her upcoming action, and still her action was the same. I am going to talk to the man of God. I am going to ask him for deliverance. She was determined. She was grateful. She said, I am going to get my deliverance this day. Another word I would say is that she was broken, that she was desperate. Sometimes you got to get, it it takes getting desperate. Sometimes it takes getting desperate to get to the place where I know that nothing else I can do, say, nobody else I can talk to, nobody else I can go to for advice is going to solve my problem. Sometimes it takes us getting desperate to finally turn to Christ and say, God, all right, I've tried everything I could possibly try, and now I put myself at your mercy. Sometimes you have to get desperate. And I would say that she was desperate. Now, the third person in this equation was Jesus himself. What are some words that you would describe Jesus as? Forgiving, humble, spirit-filled, kind, merciful. Yes, non-judging. Teacher. All these things you could use to, to, to describe Jesus. He was a physician. He was a healer. He was a savior, absolutely. So there's all these things that we, we think of when we hear the word Jesus Christ. And the word was out because he knew he was in town. Yes, he had already before the word was already out. She knew about Jesus because he had already been performing acts. He'd already been teaching and preaching, and everybody knew who he was. Another thing that I want to bring back to about, about the, the, the Pharisee is this. The Pharisees were knowledgeable individuals. They knew the word of God. They understood the word of God. They were also political individuals that were very driven by um, fame and fortune and being in front of everybody. So they wanted people to look at them highly, especially from a Christian standpoint. So the Pharisee knew all these things that Jesus had done. And because he knew that and he wanted the fame, he wanted the glory, he invited Jesus into his house so that people could see him with Jesus, right? So he could be able to say, wow, he's hobnobbing with Jesus. He's hopping on hopping with the possible Messiah. Wow, he knew this man. So he invited Jesus into his house because he had a preconceived notion that Jesus was the Messiah, that Jesus was a man of God, that Jesus was legit. So he invited Jesus into his house. But let's fast forward a little bit because we need to understand that the Pharisee had some ulterior motives. He wanted to get something out of this. And we look at the scripture in verse 39, and let's break it down. First of all, it says, When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself. So first of all, he didn't speak this out loud. He said this to his own self. He was thinking this. He said, If this man were a prophet. Let's stop right there. So we already said initially he believed that Jesus was a man of God and that he was a prophet and he was all these things. But all of a sudden, this individual started to question Jesus and his assertion about who Jesus was changed. His preconceived notion was changed on a dime because of this woman. 
And now he began to say, instead of this is a man of God, he said, if this man was a prophet. You see how quickly we can change our minds? Not only did this man just change his mind, but he was not just a common man. He knew everything about the Bible. And just because this one thing, this one instance of how things look, he changed his whole perspective on who Jesus was to now question whether Jesus was even a man of God or a prophet. So he starts to question whether, God, whether Jesus is a man of God. Now, why did he change his mind? He did it based on two assertions that were both incorrect. Let me show you the first one. He said, if he knew, I mean, uh, he, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is. So first of all, he assumed that Jesus didn't know who this woman was. He also further concluded that he didn't know that she was a sinner. And so this was his first assertion that made him change his mind. The second assertion was that he didn't know that she was, sorry, that she was a sinner. So he didn't think he knew who was touching him and that she was a sinner. But the fact of the matter was that Jesus did know who she was. Jesus did know that she was a sinner. And guess what? Jesus did know that if he allowed this woman to do these things, that people would look at him funny. How many of you have been put into a situation where you needed to minister or to do something and you had to think in your mind, should I do this? Because if I do this, people are going to look at me strange. People are going to look at me funny. People are going to question, what, what, am I really sane or whether I'm just going crazy? Sometimes we have to forget what other people have to say about us and we just have to do what God is commanding us to do. Sometimes it's not going to be the popular thing. Sometimes it may be the insane thing. But the bottom line is it doesn't matter what it looks like, sounds like, or is. The bottom line is what did God say to do? And if God said to do it, then we forget every other preconceived notion that is swimming around in our atmosphere. Because it's all about doing what God says to do. So this individual, this highly intelligent man, as though we thought he was, the problem is our, our, our notion was that he was an intelligent man. But, the, but our fault in that is that he did know the word of God, but he didn't know God. He didn't have a relationship with God. You can tell me all, I can tell you all the words in the, in the world to describe my wife. And I could say all kinds of wonderful things. But unless you have in a relationship with my wife where you really, really know her at a personal level, you can't really know her. You only know what you know from my perspective based on what I said. But there's a difference between knowing words and knowing a person's heart. There's a difference between knowing some, some concepts and some things about a person but than it is to spend time with them and to really see what they're all about. Do you know Christ? Or did you just read a couple words in the book and now you're an expert on him? Do you know him? This individual thought he knew the word of God. He thought he knew what Christ wanted. But ultimately, he was wrong because he didn't know Christ. Jesus doesn't care about what you did 10 years ago. He doesn't care what you did 10 months ago. He doesn't care what you did 10 weeks ago. He doesn't even care what you did 10 minutes ago. All he wants to know is in this moment right now, do you love me? Is your heart towards me? 
In that moment, that woman sinned all her life, maybe. But Jesus did not care. All he knew is that her heart was hungry for him to be righteous. And so the past did not matter. All that he cared about was fright then and there. So yes, he knew her. Yes, he knew he, she was a sinner. But he knew that she had a heart to serve him. Jesus. And he wanted, she wanted to be saved. And she wanted to be restored. So verse 40 goes on to say, Jesus answered him. And again, this man didn't say it out loud. This is just Jesus knowing what's going on and says, Simon, I have something to tell you. He says, tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owe money to a certain money loaner. One owed five, 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back. So he forgave the debts of both. Now, give, now, which of them will love him more? Simon himself said, I suppose the one that had a bigger debt to be forgiven. And he said, you have judged correctly, Jesus said to him. So, first of all, Jesus is giving to him once again a parable. And I need to stop right here because I'm really excited about this, because I really love when Jesus breaks people down like this. He's about to break this dude down like a fraction. He is ready to go in. And I love when Jesus uses your own words against you to rebuke you. I don't really love it when he does it to me, but when he does it to other people, I'm all in. So this is what he says to the man. He says, Then he turned towards the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house, and you did not give me any water for my feet. But she, but she, but she, she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss. But this woman, from the time I entered into this place, has not stopped kissing my feet. And you did not put oil on my head, but she has poured, per, uh, poured perfume on my feet. And then he goes on to say, therefore I tell you, therefore I tell you that is so educated, Therefore, I tell you that is so willing to judge this woman. Therefore, I tell you who thought they were doing the right thing. Therefore, I have to say to you, I want to tell you something. Therefore, I tell you, her, uh, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. But whosoever has forgiven little loves little. So in other words, you feel you have nothing to be forgiven for. You, you feel that you are perfect. You feel like you have done all that you need to qualify for my grace and my goodness. Because of this, you don't truly love me like she loves me. And so he shows him that all these things that you have done in your life that you are so proud of mean nothing. Because you don't love me like she loves me. You didn't even acknowledge me when I came into your house. God is saying some of us haven't really acknowledged that he has come into your life. How do I know this? Because you don't treat him like you should. You don't give him the righteousness that you should. God is saying he is, he is coming into your heart and tried to change you, but you haven't greeted him like you should. But this woman that was so-called a sinner, that was some considered uneducated, unclean, this woman gave everything she had to him in this moment because she was desperate for a change in her life. She was desperate for something to change in her circumstance. She did not want to be the same anymore. She was desperate. And because of her desperation, 
she gave him such a praise and gave him such devotion and gave him such honor and such reverence. And she put aside her pride. She put aside every, everything that other people may say. And she said, God, I don't care anymore. But if you would forgive me, if you would forgive me, Lord, people like that will serve him with everything that they have. With everything that they have. You see, when you think you have arrived, you feel like you don't have to do anything to continue to stay there. But when you know where you came from and what you used to be and what you used to do and what you come out from and how dirty you were and the muck and mire clay that is still on your shoes you realize that God I can only do this through you God I thank you for your love God I understand now what grace means Lord, I understand now what mercy is. God, forgive me. But when they say forgive me, their heart is true. Many times, many people say forgive me, but they don't mean forgive me. Nah, nah, they're not laying it all on the floor. They're not all putting it at his feet. They do like the Pharisee. They welcome him. They bring you in. But they didn't honor or reverence him. Not one bit. Not one bit. So if you would ask me, who would I rather be like? Would I rather be the Pharisee or the so-called sinner? Sign me up for the sinner every day of the week and twice on Sunday. Because we got to get to a point where pride, mm, where pride doesn't keep us from being one God wants us to be because we think we we have arrived and and we think that people are looking at us and we think that people see us in a certain light i'm telling you if you really want to have a real righteous relationship with christ you don't care you don't care what people say about you you don't care what people think about you. You will come and you will cry out at the altar and say, God, I don't care what people think. I just want to get it right with you. Yeah. Yeah, it's nice to be thought of highly. Sure, that's cute. But I would rather God looks at me and sees my heart and says, this is my son well, whom I am well pleased than to have everybody in this building look at me and say, oh, wow, look how good a person he is. Oh, wow, isn't he great? Man, wow, doesn't he look good? All that means nothing, nothing. If you don't have the love of God, that's the only thing that matters. No, pride, that can go by the wayside. Because all it takes... <laughs> All that pride that you might have, all that prestige that you may have gotten over the years that makes people think that you're so great and so wonderful and awesome and all these things, all it takes is for one person to say something negative about you on social media. And all of a sudden, all the works that you've ever done in your life, all those things that made you so proud, all those things are wiped away with one post. And all of a sudden, your entire life, your ministry, everything is canceled. And you know what makes it that much worse? It doesn't even have to be true. It doesn't even have to be true. But if they could get enough people to believe the lie, 
then all of a sudden, it's all gone. All gone. Everything you hung your hopes on, everything you hope, put your, your faith and your dreams in, all of your pride, all that, all that that you did and you worked, and now it's gone like that. So I don't know about you. I choose not to put my hope and my trust in earthly vessels. <laughs> hey, God. God, I choose to put my faith, my trust, my treasures, all that I am that is worth anything in you. In you. So, again, he tells this individual, you've done all these things, but I'm telling you, this woman, this woman has his heart in that moment. Has his heart in that moment. Oh, to be loved by God. Oh, to be loved by God. So I just say this to let us know that preconceived notions can be good and they can be bad. But we have to be mindful of where those notions come from. For example, how many of you have had preconceived notions spoken into your life from family members, from teachers, from all kinds of people telling you that you weren't going to make it? Telling you that you're not smart enough to go to college, maybe you should go to trade school. Telling you that you're never going to amount to anything. I love this one. You're going to be just like your daddy. They know good and well your daddy's in jail. Your daddy's a drug addict. Your daddy's a murderer. You know your daddy's uh, sleeping all around. And they tell you, 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 you're just like your daddy. How many people have spoken preconceived notions into your life time and time again? The question is, do you choose to believe their word? Whose report will you believe? Will it be God or will it be man? And I'll leave you with this one thing. I don't care what people said about you or who it is that said it. It could be your mama. Once you grab hold to God's life, once you accept him into your life, you are a new creature. Behold, all those old things are washed away. And guess what? <laughs> the next time they say you look like your daddy, you know what you tell them? You tell them, thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Those are the kindest words you've ever said to me. Thank you. I accept that. I am. I am just like my father, which is, by the way, in heaven. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Don't let other people's preconceived notions affect your life. Amen. So in conclusion, I just challenge us to not let these things into our lives and that we don't allow these preconceived notions to be chains that weigh us down and that we only allow ourselves to be influenced by the word of God, by what God says about us, what God is doing in us, what God is doing through us, and let nobody bring those into question. And last of all, let us, not, let us be uh, quick to listen and slow to speak, as it says in James, the first chapter, 19. And it also said, let us, I mean, and I also want to remind us to let us give ourselves and others grace to grow the space to be human, and the compassion to be loved.